Hello, this is English Buddhist terminology, and today let us look at the term the three Dharma seals. When we learn Buddhism, um, we would always say that we're learning Buddhism so that we can realize the truth of the universe, uh, that we can understand the truth of life. But then a question that follows this would be, what exactly is a truth? And what defines a truth? So how do we know that when we are being taught a concept that it does represent the truth? And in response to such a question, the Buddha taught us the three Dharma seals as a way for us to define truth and to apply a concept to these seals to see whether they do are fit into the criteria of a truth. And Buddhism has given us four characteristics of what we call ultimate truths. For one thing, a truth has to be universal. And secondly, it has to be inevitable. It has to be necessary. And thirdly, it has to be true in the past. And finally, it has to also be true in the future. Therefore, for a truth to be a truth, it has to possess all of these four characteristics. An example of an ultimate truth would be death. For example, everyone dies. So it's universal, it happens to every single person. And it says it's inevitable. So it has to happen to everybody, eventually. No one can escape the truth of death or the process of death. And such an idea applied to people from the past. And they also apply to people in the present and also in the future. In other words, it will always be true. Therefore, death fits into the four characteristics of an ultimate truth. It's universal, it's inevitable, it's true in the past, it's true in the future. Therefore, we can see that it is a truth. And in other words, when we look at the three Dharma seals, they are like a seal that help us authenticate whether something is true or not. And then in a lot of cases, these three Dharma seals are also what makes Buddhism called a philosophy rather than a religion because you can simply analyze this concept, analyze this idea, and inquire into it, investigate, and then apply it to your everyday life, and then it works. You don't have to have faith in Buddhism in order to believe it. That's why it gives Buddhism a characteristic of philosophy. Okay, let's now look at the term, the three Dharma seals. As we look at seal, it means all things are stamped with them. Therefore, the three Dharma seals are carried in all the truth of the universe and in everything as a matter of fact. And there's nothing that does not possess these characteristics. So you carry the seal of the three Dharma seals. You, I do, I also carry such seals. In, in other words, it's a truth that exists in all of us. And we can even say that a, a seal is similar to official seals used to prove that documents are real and that they are not forged. Like in Chinese we say, 政治表記 it's exactly the same thing. You have this seal, then you'd be pretty much guaranteed that this is the real thing. And on the contrary, we can also say that anything that is not stamped with these three characteristics will not be the truth. Anything that complies or does not contradict the three Dharma seals will become the authentic teachings of the Buddha. If we were to say that the Buddha was there himself, and he would talk about a truth which actually contradicts the three Dharma seals. And then we can have enough reasons to say that these are not the truth because they do not comply uh, with the three Dharma seals. Therefore, any truth, anything that we call the truth, is stamped with all three of the Dharma seals must be true, whether the Buddha said it or not. Even the Buddha said this himself. He told his disciples, Do not believe in what I say just because I said it. Inquire into the truth of my teachings. 
Therefore, he encouraged his disciples to question and investigate the, the teachings he had spoken of. He wanted them to test them, experience them for themselves, to see whether this is the truth, whether it applies to every sentient being in this world. So basically, um, the three Dharma seals are another way of looking at truths that are fundamental to reality. So today we are going to discuss ways for us to discover whether something is a truth or not. And what do the three Dharma seals consist of? They are the following. The three Dharma seals tell us that, number one, all phenomena are impermanent. Number two, no phenomena has a self. Number three, Nirvana is the ultimate peace. That's what they're trying to tell us. And first of all, let us look at impermanence as the first seal. When we say that all phenomena are impermanent, it means all phenomena change. They are in a constant state of flux and they can never stay the same. And impermanence applies to everything. Just as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus says, you can never step into the same river twice. And if we were to look at this from the Buddhist perspective, if the Buddha himself was to see this sentence, he would probably have pointed it out that the same foot doesn't step into the same river twice, since the foot itself is ever-changing as well. So, from the Buddhist perspective, we can add to Heraclitus' saying by saying that you never step into the same river in the same way twice, as everything is in a constant state of flux. The body continues to change, the flow of the river continues to change, so you can never put the same foot into the same river twice. Now, another example of uh, forever-changing phenomena is the process of birth and death. We are born into this world, we grow older, we get sick, then we die. This is a constant state of change in our life. Every one of us must experience these changes. No one can get away from such a process. Another example could be the four seasons. First there is spring, and then the season changes into summer, and then it changes into autumn, it changes into winter again. You can never stay in the same season all the time. Unless, say, you're in a certain part of a certain country that experiences longer summer or longer winter. But at the same time, you still have to realize that it never stays exactly the same. It will always be changing. There has to be a time when the weather becomes colder or warmer. And this too is an example of change. And plants, too, display this very quality of impermanence. Take a flower as an example. Uh, a flower is composed of elements that are constantly changing. Therefore, in a flower, we can see a constant process of metabolism. They grow, they wilt, and then new flowers grow again, and then they wilt, and then newer flowers grow again and so on. So this is also a status of change. In other words, Buddhism talks about how things are born, how things abide, and then things die. Sentient beings are like this. Even stars in the, in the universe are also like this. Even our thoughts. One moment we could be thinking about one thing, and then in the next moment this thought could go away. Therefore, a thought arises and then ceases. Therefore, our thoughts are also constantly changing. In other words, nothing stays the same. Nothing is permanent. This is what impermanence is trying to tell us. Once there was a woman who had just lost her son. Her son died of uh, some serious illness. She became very, very sad and started going to people and asking them for ways to bring her son back. She rang into everybody. She, whoever she rang into, she would ask, do you know how to bring my son back to life? Can you resurrect my son? Words started to pass around, and then one day, this woman came to the Buddha and said, You are a Buddha. You are the knower of truth. Do you have a way to, to help me bring my son back into this world? 
And of course, the Buddha was an enlightened person. He did not try to immediately explain that people have to die, which is an inevitable process in life, because this would not have helped the woman accept it. Instead, she told this woman to go and find a plant called the lucky grass. He said to her, try and go to a household within which nobody had ever died. And you will find a plant that grows on their doorway, which is the lucky grass. And if you can find this grass, you will be able to bring your son back to life. Okay, the woman was very happy. She thought she had finally found a solution. Therefore, she started looking into houses, asking every household she could find and asked them, has anyone ever died in your house? And not a single household was able to tell her that no, no one, nobody in our family lineage had ever died because that's simply not possible. And after running all through all of these households, it helped the woman realize that death is in fact an an inevitable process that happens to everybody in life. Therefore, she went back to the Buddha and said, Dear Buddha, I now understand. I now understand that life is impermanent, and I simply have to accept that it is a fact. This had helped her accept the death of her son more easily because she realized that everything, including life of humans, are in a constant stage of change. So by realizing this, impermanence will become a truth that makes us or gives us greater strength to accept things which do not go according to our wishes. Okay, now there are two basic kinds of impermanence. So we can think about them in two different kinds of length. Say for example, the first one is what we call momentary impermanence. And when we talk about moments, it means the smallest unit of time. Basically, it's a very, very short period of time. And how short is it? According to the record of investigations of mysteries, it tells us that a moment is as long as one thought. And a single snap of the fingers contains 60 moments. That's how short a moment can be. For example, we just... I just go like that. And then when, as soon as I've done that, 60 moments would have already passed. And that's how short a moment can be. And then the reign of tre our Treasure Sutra continues to tell us that the deluded mind is like so, so much running water. It rises and falls without ceasing. Like lightning, the moments come and go without ceasing. That is a process of impermanence and change. In other words, our minds and our perceptions are constantly changing from one moment to the next. And not only are our minds changing, our bodies, everything in the universe are constantly changing from one moment to the next. Just like how it has been said that every seven years, all of the cells in our body would have been totally renewed because our cells die and then new cells are born. So in seven years' time, we would have become a totally new person. Our body may have totally become different because of the new cells that had grown to replace the dead cells and so on. So these are all examples of impermanence. Okay, that was the first type of impermanence.